if I spend six months less on this sale, I can probably share some of that margin with you. That's gold. Sorry, continue. You just blew my mind. That's brilliant. <laughs> Extreme ownership, two, growth mindset, and number three is the leaf. I think we forget how fast we're going. I think we forget how much we're achieving. I think we forget what we do as a team. I will admit, Andy, it caused me so much anxiety thinking, man, I've, I've got to make it. I've got to make every one of these work. And when a couple of them didn't, man, I got to tell you, it was devastating. You're not the first guy to, to deal with issues, right? Like this has happened to all of us. Um, it's how you deal with those. A medic is not about being perfect. It's, it's identifying the gaps to fill them. All right, welcome to a new episode of Masters of Medic. I'm here with Richard Duffy, the CRO of Arcos Labs. Welcome to the show, Richard. Hey, good day, Andy. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Why, for our lovely audience, uh, why do you not introduce yourself? Let us know how you got into this wonderful world of sales. Yeah, I would love to, mate. Um, I think, uh, I think, like most folks, uh, you know, I, I didn't plan it. I wasn't a little boy who said, "When I grow up, I want to be." Uh, but so glad that I did. Um, you know, I came out of university uh, originally from Sydney, Australia. Uh, went to the UK for a year with uh, with Audi. Uh, realized that I didn't want to be in the supermarket game or, or FMCG, uh, flew back to Australia. Uh, amazing time at, the, at that point in time. Uh, went back to actually run with the uh, Olympic torch during the Sydney Olympics. And after that crazy kind of two, three weeks of Olympics, realized I needed a job. And uh, when I was talking to folks about what I'd be good at, someone said, I think you'd be good in sales. Introduced me to a guy that happened to be at the same local surf club. Uh, I, I love the old days where he was then like, oh, yeah, okay, let's give you a shot. And that was my uh, entry into sales. Um, so from there, uh, I'd say I got most of my early learnings uh, with a company called Front Range, uh, which ended up being acquired by Avanti. Mm -hmm. And the VP there, who I learned a lot from, Archie Wilson, went over to Veritas. Um, and so I joined Veritas. And, you know, this was back in kind of 04, 05. Um, and it was right at the time, Andy, when then... I think I'd been there four months and Semantic acquired Verita Veritas and uh, I kind of then spent my next eight years with, with Semantic. But uh, a couple of years after that, um, funny story. So this year is actually uh, my 15 years in America okay, and cool. how I got here was with Semantic. So we'd, uh, we'd had some, some awesome, you know, success down, down in Oz uh, with, with the team down there. We, we kind of built and created some some semantic first, really large deals, and a couple of folks from from headquarters at the time came down to kind of talk to the customers, learn what we were doing, you know, help us with them. Uh, and there was one guy uh, called Stephen Chung, who was our VP at the time over in the US, who came down and said, "Hey, I, I want to meet you know Telstra was was the big deal that we were doing at the time down in down in Australia," and uh, I remember him taking me out for dinner on the last night to thank me, I, I thought, and kind of lo and behold, he, he then said, hey, I'd like to offer you a job. Do you want to come back to the States with me? And wow. uh, I was like, okay, yeah, look, you know, a couple of years, sounds good, you know, that'll be fun. Let's go to California, play in the big leagues. That was in 2007, Andy, and uh, here I am now in 2022, still um, still in, in the US, but a phenomenal, phenomenal experience and ride with Semantic. Um, I think most people should start off in a semantic like big, you know, bigger company, mm. phenomenal training, great mentorship. You know, Stephen was a, a phenomenal leader and mentor for me. And there were a bunch of other folks over there at the time. You know, we we're under, you know, greats like John Thompson, you know, uh, Enrique Salem. It, it was just a phenomenal period. And a lot of those semantic folks, um, you know, a little bit like the, the PTC kind of crew who then broke off. A lot of those folks have gone on to some pretty amazing, uh, amazing highs after that. So um, cool. then after Semantic, uh, I was working with a company at the time called AppDirect as a partner mm -hmm. and got to know the founders there really well. I think you, you, you know one of the founders there quite well, Daniel Sachs, yeah. um, and was just really intrigued by what they were doing. And um, it was funny, like 
a lot of these things happen. Uh, over dinner one night, um, you know, Daniel said, hey, we're, we're raising our, our first round. Uh, would you be interested in coming over and running worldwide sales? And uh, it was a little scary at the time. Uh, I got to admit, I was running a billion dollar business at um, Semantic at the time. And going from that to a company that wasn't even doing a million dollars in yeah. revenue was 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 a little frightening. I'm, I'm not going to lie, but but it was funny. I was at a point in my career at Semantic where I was about to go on an executive MBA to Stanford, and I wow. kind of sat back and and realized, okay, I'm, I go to this startup thing and w- real world MBA or or the Stanford MBA, and, and I think they're both phenomenal, you know, uh, options. Um, but yeah. I'm so glad I I took the uh, the app direct route, and uh, so help you know worked with with Dan and Nick and the whole team there. And we scaled app direct from zero to hundred million in, in four wow. years. We were a unicorn. It was, it was a phenomenal ride. A lot of very passionate, um, you know, entrepreneurial spirit there. Um, and, and again, I look at back, just like I look at semantic as kind of where I cut my teeth and, you know, had a lot of my early foundational learning app direct was definitely where I had my, my kind of, you know, where I, I really picked up on the, entrepreneurial spirit that let's go build something uh and uh yeah so that was fantastic uh, went to a couple of other startups in between uh I have and to ask now- questions about, about uh, the other jobs you took did you did someone take you out for dinner first because i'm spotting a trend here are you, are you a foodie is that what it is anyone's you're, listening you're right. CEOs? <laughs> just you're, if you're you want right. to hire richard take me out for dinner <laughs> well i think they say sales people are the easiest people to sell to right and now you've just yeah. made me realize that folks used my kind of superpower of let's go out and have a nice dinner and get a deal done. And I think they, they've been using that against me um, or, or for me. I don't know. Um, yeah. But well, funnily enough, here at Arcos, uh, Kevin Kevin took me out for lunch. So, uh, and actually then we went out for dinner that same night um, in there downtown San Francisco. So, okay, I'm going to be very wary from now on when people <laughs> ask me out for dinner, Andy. Yes, indeed. I love that. I love that. But that you know, that's the way to your heart. It seems it's ways you, you wait to take care of a dinner. I like that. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. So you went from um, yeah, well, App Direct. I know you went for a number of like sales leadership roles, CRO roles. What 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 what, what, what were they? What was the any of those really stand out? No, look. I think you know one of the things I've learned, um, Andy, when you're in kind of startup land and build, you know, build out. Um, you know, it's funny. You, you talk. I've got a bunch of you know buddies in the VC world, right? And you, you know, you ask the VCs and you'll get different answers, but they look for one in X number to be successful, right? Um, you need a lot of ingredients for a startup to work. You also need a lot of ingredients as a leader to to work at a startup, right? Not only do you need to make sure that the company has product market fit, but you're really looking for really strong cultural uh, and leadership uh, immersion. You know, you, you really need to, there needs to be a strong fit. And people often say to me, what do you put the success down to at AppDirect? And, and it's very similar to my comments about Semantic. It was the people. It's always the people. people. And there was just this camaraderie and everyone, you know, being on the same page. It was funny, you know, listening to a couple of your pod, other podcasts, I think you and I are very similar in using analogies. I'm, I use, yeah. you know, war analogies and I use sporting analogies. <laughs> same. And yeah, right, right. And, <laughs> and, you know, I think when you go to battle, You've, I mean, you've got to be on the same page. You've, you've got to want to enjoy staying back in the office, going out for dinner afterwards, strategizing. I, I see photos pop up on my social media now of App Direct days around a boardroom, you know, nine, 10 o'clock at night. There's Chinese all over the table, bottles of red wine open. You know, back in the day, we were still wearing suits and ties. The ties are down. And, and I look at those and I remember those nights, Andy. I remember them with just such fondness and i you know i'll I'll text dan and and brandon and nick and a whole bunch of the original team and and we all get this kind of ah you know that was that was amazing and you know that that is really what you need to find um and so kind of to come back to your question i went to a couple things in the middle where where i didn't find that and maybe they didn't find that in me and and i've got to a point where i've realized that's okay right yeah and you've you've got to kind of but i think what it teaches you is you over time, I think you start getting a better feel for what you need to look for. And mm-hmm. just as, as you do as a hiring manager and a, as a leader, I think in both ways, you you get a better feel of what's my superpower? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And what do I need? You know, what what do I need? And maybe I didn't quite realize this. I think my coaches and mentors have told me what I what I've needed and I've gone, oh yeah, you're right. 
but it, it's funny when you, you you try to fight the universe, it just throws you back down, right? One of my one of my coaches and mentors says to me, you know, Richard, sometimes you got to go up the mountain and come back down to really appreciate it and and mm-hmm. learn from the experience. And I think if anyone out there listening thinks that anyone just has this meteoric, meteoric rise without any issues or downside along the way, it, it's just not true. Right. Yeah. Um, so people are either not being truthful or, uh, or, or they're one in a million. I, I don't know, Andy. I mean, you, you know, a lot of folks too. And I would say I've, I, I feel anyway, I learned just as much from the ones that didn't work out mm-hmm. as the ones that did. And now when I came over to Arcos, one of the things I was really looking for and what attracted me to Arcos was Kevin, the founder, the, the chief product officer at the time, Ashish, the board members, um, because I, I knew what had worked in the past and I also knew what, what didn't work. And when I met these guys, I was kind of like, okay, this is, this is you know, we always say to ourselves, this is the one, right? This is the next one. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I I love sports analogies as well, war analogies. And what I always think about in line with what you say there is, is in in sports, when you have the the head coach, the manager, depending on, you know, what what sport it is and what country the the, the sport is in, you know, you have, you think of some of the greatest coaches of all time, some of the goats, no matter what the sport is, American football, you know, European football, any other sport. Find me one that has never been, never had a hard season a couple of hard seasons been like left the left left the team through not their choice you know what i mean yeah. and, 100%. and it's like yeah it you know I, I i'll admit andy it caused me so much anxiety mm-hmm. kind of growing up in as a svp cro thinking that that wasn't the case exactly thinking yeah. Yeah man, I've, I've got to make it. I've got to make every one of these work. And when a couple of them didn't, man, I got to tell you, it was devastating. It, mm. it was like, what's wrong with me? Like, mm. people don't fail, right? And mm. now I look back with this kind of Richard, man, you're just, you're being so stupid, right? And, yeah. but again, you've got to be able to climb up the mountain, come back down and then start going back up. And I think you do it differently, right? Mm. Um, there's a lot of similarities, but, but you do it differently. You know, and to your analogy, there's a great um, five series, um, five part series on Netflix right now called uh, The Playbook. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's with five different coaches. I don't know if you've seen it. I've and seen it, yeah. yeah, and it was so great to watch that because to your point, not one of them, not one of them came from great and ended on great. Yep. You know, most of them kind of came from nowhere, came from nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's I always love those stories, right? Mm-hmm. Built up then kind of got hit and it's like a Hollywood movie, right? It's, it's the rise, it's the fall. And then it's the, hopefully it's the, it's the rise and, and the positive finish. Yeah. Right. Um, but it was great watching that. Cause to your point, I was watching that going, man, this is kind of funny. I, that feels like when I went here or when I did that, or when we thought we were going to get acquired or when this happened. And it was just funny to realize that it happens to everyone. Right. And I think, yeah. I think what it's taught me now is, is to focus and this sounds probably a little cliche, but focus on the journey, right? Because mm-hmm. once you get, I was talking to a, I was talking to a mentor last night, Stephen Chung, and the guy that, the guy that sat me down for dinner in Sydney and convinced me to move to the US for for two years, right? And I mean, <laughs> Stephen's crushed it, right? I mean, he's gone, you know, he was at SVP at Salesforce, he built out, you know, Demandware, he CRO at Pager Duty, now he's president over at Delphix, and talking to him last night, you know, just talking about every day, kind of, oh man, hey, you know, what would you do? Richard, I've seen this movie before, man. Like, this, you're not the first guy to, to deal with issues, right? Like, this has happened to all of us. Um, it's how you deal with those. And, and that's where I think, Andy, you and I have spoken about this before. I think having a network, having, a, you know, uh, folks to talk to, people that have been there, right, coaches or mentors, because I think that's the other thing. You know, we go back to the sporting analogy, right? Everyone has coaches, right? The, 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 the best players choose your choose your sport tennis football you know basketball but the best players in the world have coaches mm-hmm. right why do they need a coach they're the world number one right yeah. but yet we we in sales invariably don't have coaches um, and I think that's one of the biggest things that I try to and one of the things we've done recently we've brought on a goat from you know the sales world in in Jim drill 
yeah. uh, you know, BMC fame, you know, Lithium, you know, just phenomenal leader, uh, you know, part of the original crew under under uh, PTC and, and John McMahon, right? And he doesn't just work with me. He works with my, my direct reports and helps coach them. And his role for us is to help coach and mentor, advise, help, help get the best out of people because I don't have all the answers, Andy. Um, and, and, you know, having that access has just been the, the shift I've seen in my team and myself by having that outside coach come in and spend time with us, dramatic. Yeah, that was one of the things that I really, really appreciated about you when we first got to work together and, and get to talk was just like, and, and, and the audience will hear it straight away from hearing you just speak for the last sort of 10 minutes, is just how open-minded you are to like, you know, we would, if we were talking about an AE right now, we would say they're coachable, right? Which is, we know is one of the most important traits in sales. And so like, it's just awesome. I have to say just to, you know, I meet lots of coachable AEs, lots of coachable like managers, but someone as a CRO who has that, that open mind and get, you know, and, and you just said it yourself, you know, you're seeing the difference from, from having Jim, um, engage with the team, and I've I've seen you know, I've been lucky enough to be in some um, some sessions with him and your team as well, and yeah. you know that, that kind of uh, that that kind of perspective that he brings to the table with the experience, and then just you you and him vibing and and riffing about deals and stuff, and and it says to your whole team, hey, we we've not completed this game of sales yet. We've still got a lot to learn, and and guess what? You know there is no completed level. We're always leveling up. It's cool. Yeah, I, I think I think you're spot on, Andy. I mean, I think there was a period of time there where I don't think I ever thought I didn't need a coach. I just think I didn't think about it, if that makes sense. I was caught up in executing, right? And I think one of the one of the you know I've, I've spoken to other you know friends that are in similar roles to me and have come from a come a similar trajectory, right? Where you go from a big company and you all of a sudden before you know it, you're a VP of sales. Mm -hmm. The one downside of being a VP of sales in an early stage startup is you no longer are reporting to someone that potentially has more experience than you in your domain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So phenomenal point. entrepreneurs, phenomenal leaders, phenomenal culture builders, right? But haven't sold more than you, haven't built teams longer than you, haven't been through the journey longer than you to be able to give you the perspective. And so I think probably my only I wouldn't call it regret, but maybe more hindsight looking back is I wish I did this sooner. And because then to your point, it, how, how do I tell my team, you know, because so we have three big things we talk about in, in our go-to-market team at Arcos, right? That, that I've carried with me since AppDirect days. One, extreme ownership. Two, growth mindset. And kind of wrapping around it, not really number three, is, is belief, right? If we don't believe in ourselves, each other, and, and the company, kind of forget about it. But how, how do you talk about values like growth mindset? How do you talk about coachability? Uh, we built out our ideal candidate profile here at Arcos with, with Jim's help. Mm -hmm. And we talk about, you know, number one for us is PhD, right? Perseverance, heart, desire. Number two is intellectual curiosity. Number three is coachability. How, how do we talk about those things if I, I'm not open to to coaching and and being vulnerable and being transparent about that because at the end of the day it's about the journey together it's it's not about trying to be all things right now you know yeah oh god i love this i'm just this is one of those moments where i'm like that that i'm trying to write it down trying to keep up with it the, the extreme ownership growth mindset and belief that last one belief you know how how I really like that because of how much it crosses over into the the aura in which your team will give to your prospective customers in the hey I believe in this mission and I'm going to I believe in it so much that the only impression you can get from me as a prospective customer is that you know I'm obsessed. I'm only here today to talk to you because I've got the best news for you. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be bringing a proposition to you that's going to solve big, big problems. And I know with our codes, that's like, those, those are big, big problems that, that you're solving for people. And, I'm, and you know, it's, you can only just see that by just looking at the growth that you guys are doing just in the numbers of people, which is, which is awesome to see. Awesome to see. So I love, I love, how, how do you, how do you communicate that one to the team, the belief one? Because obviously it's not, it's a bit like trust, isn't it? You can't make someone believe, you can't make someone trust you. So how do you, how do you find that, that, that fire? 
Yeah, so I, I agree you can't make someone believe. Um, but what you can do is demonstrate perspective and help them mm -hmm. see, right? So, for example, our sales kickoff last January, San Diego, Jim was there. It was his first engagement with us as an advisor. And he walked in. And what we had done was we put up, um, Julie, my head of revenue ops, it was her idea. We put up these, like when you go to a conference or an expo and there's those pull-up banners, right? Mm -hmm. we, we did one with all of our logos. And we mm -hmm. put it on the stage. And it sat on the stage the whole three days of the sales kickoff. And Jim walks in, I think day two, and tells me this story afterwards. He goes over to Kevin, our CEO and founder, and he was like, I mean, Kevin, I got to tell you, like Richard had told me how great this was and what you guys have achieved. But Kevin, when you guys have been around for four years and I look at these logos and I, I'm starting to understand some of the stories, you know, because Andy, invariably a lot of companies will have logos and you find out, they're in a pilot or they're in this little back room. You know, the logos that, that they that they had before I even got there and that what we've built since. And so one of the things, as an example, is helping people remember. You know, I, 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 I if any of my previous teammates and friends ever listen to this, they'll find this funny. I, I think I've sometimes claimed that I created a word called velocitization. And oh, like I'd like to think I've actually got some proof of that, but that's, that's, that's a story over a beer, right? But the concept of velocitization is when you're in an airplane and you're flying over the U United States and you look yep. down, right? And it just feels like the plane is going so slow. And you look oh, down yeah. and you're like, wow, this is kind of weird. It's like, I feel like we're nearly paused up here in the air. Like I, I could drive faster than, than this. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes in startups and in life, candidly, personally, business, I think we forget how fast we're going. I think we forget how much we're achieving. I think we forget what we do as a team. And one of the things I think every leader needs to do is kind of pause time out and, and reflect and remind people, guys, just two years ago, we weren't in this vertical. Two years ago, 80% of people in this room weren't here. A year ago, we weren't doing this. Here's what we've achieved together and here's how we did it. Now here's where we're going to go and here's how we're going to do it. And I need you to remember, I want you to remember, you have to remember, we've already done it. You've yeah. already done it, right? So I don't think you can make someone believe, but I think we've got to continue to do a better job of, of leaders of reminding people how great they already are and how great we already are and what we've achieved. And invariably back to growth mindset, we're always going to get better. We're always going to do more. But let's not mix that up with that we haven't already done some pretty damn great things to get to where we are. Yeah, God, I love I love that. And I was with you there. I was with you in the plane. I was with you looking out the window and thinking, yeah, you're right. We aren't moving very fast. And then I was like, no, actually, we are. I was totally with you. And then at the end of that story, you know what? I, I believed because I was like, yeah, I, actually, when you point that perspective on how far you've come, and, and, and I'm, I'm fortuitous enough now that I get to see many of those stories you're talking about where, uh, you know, at sales kickoffs are eternals, things like that. Yeah. And I will yeah. see, I will see like that thing they do at the start, which I love. And, you know, people listening to this who got sales kickoff season coming up, do this. You know, if you're in a high growth company, get get the people to put their hands up who were here last year and just see how many new hands go up for the who's wow. here just this the first time and especially yeah. you know as you say with a company like yours that's then you believe i like it i really like it believe itis believe itis really i incredible. love it i mean look i think we all loved ted lasso for a reason right i think like ted ted lasso should be all of our heroes right and just that simple concept of believe i think is incredible you know, it's just so, so important. Um, but again, it's not just believing in Arcos or your company, right? It's believing in yourself and believing in your team because the second we lose belief, the second you're player, again, back to the sporting analogy, I can see when, you know, I've, I've, I've been lucky enough over the last few years to coach my, my daughter's, you know, soccer or football team under 10, under 11, under 12. And you can tell the days where they go out and they don't believe they can win that match or they're not going to win that match. And guess what happens? They don't win that match, right? Yeah. When, you, yeah. when you build them up and you remind them, and hey, maybe we lost this team last season 2-1, but 
hey, we didn't have Ashley or Sarah on the team back then and we've got better and we're going to go do this. You see their faces, yeah. these 10, 11-year-old yeah. young women and you yeah. see them and you see how they go out. And, you know, we've, we've all played sports and, and coached and stuff. The, the typical kind of cliches, any first to the ball, no hands on hips, no walking back from the, the throw, right? You see those things. And it's the same in, in our world, right? I see invariably after that sales kickoff, everyone like, Rich, let's jump on that plane. Let's go see that customer. Let's run through a, a close plan. Let's do this. The trick is how do you keep that going to the next sales kickoff, right? That's the, yeah. that's the hard part. That is, you reminded me of one of my favorite quotes. And I, I, I think I've got this right, but you will know what I mean. It's a Henry Ford quote, which is like, whether you believe you can, or you believe you can't, you're right. And I, I think that's exactly what you're talking about. The, the only that. difference is you, right? That, absolutely. Yeah. Great quote. Yeah, I actually was on my, um, I was on my, I was looking for my photo album this morning on my phone. And you know, you can use like photo search now and you can yeah. like type in a word like, you know, like car and it will bring up all the cars you've got. I can't remember what the term was I typed in, but it brought up basically pictures I'd taken of my, of my journal, of my notebook. And I, oh. I have a habit of if something I, if there's something I really, really want, I will write like Bart Simpson does on the whiteboard of the the intro of The Simpsons over and over again. So the most recent one I did, we ran an event called Medicon. I think you, I think you got up at like five a.m. for you. Thank thank you for that. We've pushed the date back. Absolutely, our whole team did. Yeah, yes. And I had written like Medicon will be a huge success. Medicon will be a huge success. But what I found was via this search on my phone, it basically brought up, I don't know what, I can't remember what the term was, but it brought up all of the photos of all the things. And I was looking through, and let me tell you this, there was not one thing that I'd written over and over again, every single day that didn't come true. Now, I don't believe anything cosmic is going on there. No, like no one's looking over my shoulder from a cloud above me going, okay, Andy really wants this, we'll make it happen for him. I think what's happening there is belief. I was cultivating the belief yep. inside of me that was creating, that was working in parallel with my subconscious to tell it, hey, this is really important. Andy really cares about this. And so it starts to pick up all of the cues, all of the cues that are around me that can positively contribute towards that goal, that, that aim I have. And so many, by the way, so many of those things were we're going to hit our target for Q4. We're going to hit X million dollars by Q, uh, by the end of the year. I'm going to close X company name by X date. And for the audience, like that, that I really genuinely believe that if we, it, it, so much of what was going on there was my subconscious realizing how important it was because I was doing the preparation. I was preparing myself for something that was important and just yeah. causing myself to do nothing but focus. And it just works. I mean, I, I think whether we want to use words like manifest, positive visualization, mm -hmm. right? Goal setting, goal theory. Again, I, I always kind of say it doesn't matter which one, right? But it's, you know, go back to the old, you know, fail to plan, plan to fail. What, like the, whatever the simplicity is, if you don't put those goals down in the first place and truly, truly believe, right? Because, you know, most people do half of what you did, if, if we're lucky, which is write it down. But yep. if they if they don't really believe it, and mm -hmm. they don't go back to it, and they keep repeating, it's like the rally cries, are like right with with sales groups, right, or or or, or athletes, or, or whatever it is. You know, I've always found the years where we go, we're going to do X million by X date, or and you'll come up with a kind of fun fun cliche, five by four, yep. or wh whatever it is, right? Rob Rob, one of my my leaders right now in the West, you know, he's got a goal in Q four of what he wants to do, which is well above plan, and it's x in four and now the whole team talks about x in four and so yep. everyone's now thinking about it and now it becomes real and we're all driving towards that versus rob just thinking i, I want to hit plan this year yeah i love i i did i did the same q4 in a in a sales leadership role once where we were we were like we're looking at the number our best ever quarter was was less than half of what we had to achieve in Q4 to make up for for like the the shortfall of churn we had. It was wow. insane, and we were literally like, "This is like climbing a mountain." And we were like, "That's the theme." And so we had in our we had this great sales office, and we basically I printed out them out. Well, we were like, "It's going to be Mount Everest." Was the goal because it's obviously the biggest mountain in the world. Yeah. And then and then we we're like, "Wait, what?" And then in a separate conversation, we we're like, "We need to put an incentive on for the team if we hit this." Right. And we're like, yeah. "Why don't we make it align with the mountain theme?" I'm like, well, no one wants to go to Nepal. Like, uh, not not for like a, <laughs> oh, maybe they do. I didn't. And so we're like, well, what about, is there a mountain somewhere that's a bit 
warmer. And then we we're like, okay, Mount Kilimanjaro. And so we had this outline of Mount Kilimanjaro printed and it went wow. all the way along the wall of the office. And at the top, it had the target, the ARR target we were aiming for. Yeah. And what we did below it was we had the, the pipeline stages and every deal had, we printed the logo on a, a landscape piece of paper. And it just basically sat like a Kanban board and it just visualized the oh. entire team into what's in play. And like, there was like this, there was like, we could not wait to get a logo. A logo did not deserve to be on our wall if they weren't buying from us. So if, if, it, if, it, if it was not closing the quarter, it was like out. It was like, we, we took great pleasure in almost like creasing up and throwing away, even if it was gonna close right, the next quarter. Right. Dead to us right now, gone. And we even like went to the bit where, you know, we went as far as one guy closed two deals in one day. And we made it, we had like a little outline of a man, uh, like a mountaineer, like a cartoon. And we made him like ceremoniously like move the man up the mountain proportionally to how much his oh, ARR awesome. he had closed had taken off the target. We played like the Lion King song, you know, like the, the starting thing. And he's sort of doing this and and everyone, to your point, everyone was bought into it. Everyone, you know, and yeah. the, the, the video, we've got a video of that. It's like nine o'clock at night and the SDRs are still in the office because they're hustling for us. And, you know, the, the sales engineers are there doing it. And everyone was just together. And I, we hit the target, by the way, which is insane. Oh, I, uh, you, know, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, did they hit the target and did they yeah. go? We hit the target. And funnily enough, here's, here's a fun thing for you. The, 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 the deal that put us over uh, the, the, the target was uh, friends from your, your homeland, Cotton On. So, uh, oh, wow. so yeah, that, wow. yeah, yeah, so All a big, right. big retailer. And, and yeah. the best bit about it, just to round off this story, is that um, my, my peer and head of professional services is Rob Steele, who's our COO here at Medic. And we've got a video to your point about the stories earlier. There's a video, and I, 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 don't, I hope I don't offend you here, but there's a video of us. And we're on the speakerphone with our champion, and he said, "Yep, I'm gonna." It was actually the economic buyer, I should say. He says, "We're gonna get." Um, he says, "Yep, cool." He was in the car. He goes, "When I get to the office, that's all good. Send the docu sign. I'll sign it." And it was like eleven o'clock at night because he's in Australia, right, yep. on his way to work. And um, we're like, "Yep, thank you, cool." And hang up, and we just look. We got it on video. We look at each other. And we just start like, yeah, going crazy. And I, pr I had like Spotify queued up with the land down under. Thing. So we just, just <laughs> I love it, man. I love, love it. Australia more at the time. So, and that was the one that put right. us over. And, you know, to your point earlier. So it's, uh, and those are the things, you know, those are the bits you remember. And if you can, you know, we, we're going into, you know, we're right in the middle of Q4 right now for many, many people listening to this. So I think that's the thing, like that belief and creating that environment that we're all pulling the same direction together. Pretty cool, man. I think that's that's great. Yeah, no, that's an awesome story, man. Glad uh, glad to hear that the Aussie cotton on got you there. <laughs> um, and look, you're, you're right. Like, look, this is a tough time of year, right? Uh, you know, I got a couple of guys on my team. You know, one right now, I, I love this guy, and and he ran the table in Q4 last year, Mark. And you know, the other day, you know, we're working on a massive multi million dollar deal, and it was one of the days. You know, and these deals are roller coasters, right? And it was it was a down day. And he's like, oh, man, I, I don't think this is going to happen. And, and I let him kind of talk for a little bit. I said, hey, Mark, remember uh, remember this time last year? Remember how on that deal you you said the same thing? D did we get the deal? He's like, yeah, 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 that's right. Again, it's helping people remember. We've been here. We've got this. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll get it again. Yeah, I love that. So you talk to, we're talking about teams a lot and, and some of the yeah. great analogies that you're a CRO. So your team, we've obviously been focusing on sales, but your team is the, is, is really like, I imagine the go-to-market team, right? You know, as a chief revenue officer, you've got a much wider remit and, you know, you and I work together, um, have a great project of implementing MedPig with your team. And yeah. I know that you're like, you're a passionate advocate of MedPick, but what, one thing I know I'm really, that you're really, really hot on and really taking big steps forward on is, is thinking about Medic as being further than just the sales team. I'd love to hear some of your insights about what you're doing to, to kind of broaden MedPick yeah. internally. Yeah, look, it's funny. There's a, there's a guy on my team, our, our global head of solution consulting, uh, Ed Gower, awesome guy. And we work together at UpDirect and uh, he kind of calls me the born again Medic guy. And because look, Andy, I'll, I'll be honest, you know, when I started my career, you know, big deal hunter, um, I was probably in that camp of, you know, sales is an art, it, people buy from people, um, I've got this, right? Um, and I think, you know, as again, you mature and you, you see the empirical evidence and you realize the way people buy is changing and, and things like that. 
um, I've, I've kind of now shifted the other way. Um, I'd like to think it's a little blend of, of, of both. Um, what I started realizing was, from, from my perspective anyway, I think, you know, a lot of people look at Medic as a, a sales tool, a qualification framework, um, what, again, whatever you want to call it, a lot of different people will call it different things and, and use it in different ways. But I think the common, one of the common themes that I've picked up on is that most people will call it a sales tool or a tool for the revenue organization. Um, one of the things we've started doing a little bit differently here is using Medic as, and, you know, we, we use MedPick as a kind of framework and common language across a much broader group. So mm -hmm. kind of looking at, and, and by the way, inside and outside of the organization, and, and I'll touch on the outside in a moment, but so I'll give you an example. Um, we were sitting down with a marketing organization a, a few months ago, and we were talking about ICP and, and buyer personas and a lot of the normal, normal stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And then I was kind of walking them through the concept of the value pyramid and different messaging for different, you know, people, what, what they're, you know, going from, you know, uh, you know strategic imperatives um, down to operational, down to tactical, et cetera, and, and trying to map. And, and then I started realizing, Andy, wait on this, this maps really, really well to, to medic. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, I think most organizations look at buyer personas, for example, as a role, CISO, mm -hmm. IT manager. Mm -hmm. um, and what we started kind of riffing on was, well, wait on, there's, I think there's a little intersection here across um, kind of the, the medic kind of concept, the buyer persona concept, and kind of that traditional value pyramid concept. And mm -hmm. I said, so let's think about this. When we're marketing, when we're trying to send a message out to the world, and we all know the stats, right? We 70, 80% 70, of buyers kind of have made a decision or started researching about a, a product before they engage, et cetera. Okay. So if that's the case, how can you have one message around value prop to go out to the outside world if you've got different roles and different buyers in the, organ in, in, in the prospect organization? Yeah. And then I, I said, I don't know if we've done a good job in the sales org of maybe helping you marketing understand who we're trying to sell to on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis, right? I think mm -hmm. sometimes we expect a lot in sales, but we don't provide the feedback loop or, and, and, and the teams don't kind of think about things more as a, oh, how do, how do we get there together? And so mm -hmm. I started kind of referring to, okay, hey, hey guys, so we have this like Nirvana of this person called an economic buyer, right? Mm -hmm. And invariably on a value pyramid, the economic buyer is going to be really high up and they're going to be caring about big things, right? I think John talks about, you know, big eyes, big price type of stuff, right? Big pain, big eyes, big, big dollars, right? That person doesn't care about our latency is better than this or our catch rate is better than that, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, oh, okay, that's really interesting. And I said, but there's, there's someone down the bottom that we're going to work with coaches who are fantastic. And invariably, a lot of the, the way into an organization is going to be a coach. Now, that coach is focused on solving tactical and operational processes. So they do want to hear about, well, our solution is going to help them on a day-to-day -day basis on their team go from this state to that state, M1, M2 metrics, et cetera. So they do want to actually know about that. So we do mm -hmm. need the data. Now, then there's someone in the middle that we love the most, which is our champion. Yep. And here's what they need to hear, right? What, what's the win for them? How have we helped other champions? How do we help them see that here are champions from all of these other companies in the same role as them with the same problem where we've been able to help them go from A to B with a demonstrable outcome that has mm -hmm. helped them become a hero? You know, I, I heard you on one of your podcasts, which I love, talk about... Um, 65%, which you, I think, inflated to 85% uh, of people that used Sprinkler got promoted. And we used to say that at AppDirect all the time. And, and it was true. It was 100% invariably true. And the same has actually started happening here at, at Arpers. And, and so what I said was, we've got to help those champions realize that and see that. But where I'm going, you know, kind of long story short here, Andy, is we all started realizing that these things are all intertwined. And we have to be thinking about it when we talk internally about a buyer persona or a generic ICP 
what does that really mean? So that how can we connect the dots with value messaging, content, um, and things like that that matter? Because it is going to be different, right? We need different messaging when we're talking to an EB versus a champion versus a coach. And it was mm. the first time that I felt this amazing kind of realization between everyone in the room from their respective roles of, okay, this is actually now going to make it a lot easier to put together our messaging. Because yeah. we want when you guys in sales go and have that first call or the BDRs making that first call, depending on who we're talking to, they're going to have already heard this message delivered in this way. And then, and then we, we took that to the customer success side of the house as well, right? Which is, mm -hmm. how do you just stop using Medic at the sales, right? I mean, the whole concept of pre-sales and post-sales in my mind is, is gone. Like to me, that's dead, that's yesterday. Yeah. In a subscription yeah. economy where you have ARR, and I think right now one of the biggest metrics to kind of define or determine the success of a company is your net retention rate. Yes retaining and expanding your customers are so important. Well, how do you do that? You're constantly reminding them of the pain, implicating the pain. Yeah. And I think, yeah. and I think you talk about this in, in your, you know, in your many class, right? Is we can't just stop when we've closed the deal. We have yeah. to continually yeah. remind them of that pain and that it might go away if they stop using us. And and constantly kind of going back and working with the coaches, the champions, the economic buyers, having the, the mapping across the organization and constantly in these, whether they're monthly business reviews or quarterly business reviews, reminding them and showing them the value that you're bringing them. But again, it has to be metric based, right? I think we've all been in quarterly reviews or monthly reviews where, especially now it's worse, right? On Zoom, you, you see the eyes kind of going over here and it's like, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, no, no, yeah, no, that sounds great. Because you know, invariably, most companies will get up and talk about what we've done, but not through the eye of that champion, right? Or the coach, right? Hey, remember when we, we agreed to do this and the decision criteria was this and we implicated this pain and you agreed and we said we're going to do this? Hey, here's the really good news. We did it. We did and it, And we yeah. keep getting better together at it. And here are some of the results we've achieved together. And actually, Andy, I, what I've put together for you is this PDF doc that I want you to be able to take out across the organization. Feel free to change it. Let's work on it together. Um, one, one of the best champions I've ever worked with is uh, a guy called Nick Reaver over at Snap. Oh, cool. we, we built the business case together. And what we've done since is not just built the business case, but when we sit down and look at the progress together, it's sitting down in a room and constantly going back to the baseline metrics and assumptions that were built for that business case. And to hold yeah. each other accountable are we still there? Are we doing that? Are we doing better? And it's worked out great in that the result, results have been even better than what we, we both originally thought. But finding when you're, when you're so lucky to find a great champion, one of the, the personal advice I give to some of the folks that I, I kind of coach is I think one of the, the things sales, a lot of sales folks do, and I used to do this, that really hurts them is they get these great champions. They build these great, trusted, authentic relationships and then let them go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so right. Yeah. The yeah. amount of dinners, events, yeah. whiteboarding sessions, text messages, late nights, building this together, deals done. Okay, I'm off to the next one. Yeah. What I love about the new subscription economy, Andy, is my, my personal thesis is, you know, until you get really, really big, right, and you can potentially have account managers versus hunters, et cetera. I think for most organizations, having this kind of hybrid model where the mm -hmm. person that closes the initial deal is also responsible for realizing the value out of that mm -hmm. and then both then getting the, the reward out of that, which is hopefully continued expansion in that account yeah. and seeing mm -hmm. that value in the account and then invariably not just being successful in that account and helping your champion be successful in that account, but being able mm -hmm. to take that to look alike customers, right? And yeah. and in, in today's economy, your champion is moving around a lot more than they used to be. Yeah. Right. So if you actually do that and help them, they're going to they are going to move. Right. And yeah. now you can work together at that new organization. Yeah. And it's it's like in, in that scenario, the 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 salesperson 
yes, yeah, sure, they've won, they've won the deal, they've got their, you know, their commission, they've got the revenue against their target. But like, if you're using value, if you're value based selling, you're using MedPick as the enabler to to talk about the, the value in which you bring to your customer base, whether it be, you know, using the M1s, as we talk about, which are obviously the, the, the examples where you brought value to similar customers, to the one you're talking to. Now, if you're doing that properly, what you're talking about, yes, I've got my commission. Yes, I've got that the, the, the quota attainment from the deal. But now I've also got a, um, an, a another M1 in the oven, right? If I can now, uh, if I can now deliver on the promises to this customer, not only as you say, am I going to get the opportunity to upsell, cross sell, all that kind of stuff, but I'm also going to build a potential future M1 that I am going to be able to tell the best story about how Correct. I helped this organization. Yeah. where they were took them to this utopia state and you know don't take my word for it go and go and talk to them kind of thing and, and was, let's um, go full circle to our early part of this conversation that drives belief it does when, when it you does. can have a rep that has done that authentically with a champion that drives yeah. belief to be able to take that and then you know invariably outside of you know some companies not being able to you know talk to other companies and, and certain rules invariably that person will help talk to other customers for you or other prospects mm -hmm. for you. Because mm -hmm. if you've authentically really, really, truly tried to help that mm -hmm. champion and, and you've managed to, to deliver on that, you've now got a relationship. You've, you've now got, a, 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 you know, again, an authentic value to each other that they will help you, right? Yeah. Versus, and, and that's why, you know, you touch on commission. I think, I think the other thing that's really hard for organizations is, you know, we, we've always, always said, right, uh, compensation drives behavior. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things a lot of companies still struggle with is doing that, right? Because mm -hmm. it's hard, right? I mean, compensation tools and, and getting it right in a, in a scale up is, is really hard. But like, if I think about the perfect compensation model, it would be, how do you, how do you compensate a rep to close a deal? But then how do you actually tie them to that value realization, that adoption, right? So if you have said to a customer or a prospect that's now a customer, we're going to realize these outcomes for you. Please sign the deal. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do it. Imagine a world where we can then reward that same rep for then getting them to that and then rewarding wow. them again for renewing them and then again re rewarding them for expanding that customer. Now we're tying the compensation model to the the behaviors and drivers we want to see as an organization and i think compensation hasn't really kept up with the kind of market dynamics the subscription economy we're still kind of comping people in the old world of a three-year yeah. on-prem model for five million dollars and we'll come back in three years and try to renew it right and by then uh we're probably gonna have a different rep so it doesn't really matter and and things like but that world's changed but we haven't really as an industry right caught up and, and so yeah. we're exploring ways here at arcos where how can we do that you know how can you help tie that mm. to because if you can keep tying compensation to the right thing for the customer i mean we all know it's 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 common sense that that's just going to pay massive dividends because you know a dollar earned is, is a lot easier than a dollar you know you have to go out and get or a dollar that falls off the boat in in churn which in the current mm. kind of market economics we're in andy i think is is going to be something that surprises a lot of unfortunately surprises a lot of companies versus the last 10 years where people have kind of been able to look sideways and and not worry as much but but that's going to change yeah yeah i want to take you back to something you said um a moment ago around you were talking about how you've been working with your marketing team and getting them to kind of think about the different types of persona and things like that one of the things that's interesting to me that you know you've got you talked about how medpick in your case helps with that and one of the things I thought was really interesting, two bits of context here of, of my thinking is one is we, we had a, a new customer come on board quite recently, whilst, you know, en en enabling them for uh, medic. And um, they did, they, they were an organization that said that they were already using medic. They had had um, a, a previous set, the previous year's sales kickoff, they had had some consultants come in and do kind of a day or two's training for it. And they kind of, you know, best intentions moved forward with it. And then they, you know, coming up to the, the anniversary of that, they, feel like there's gains still to be made. And one of the things they did ahead of onboarding with us was they um, sent a survey out to all of their salespeople, the whole revenue team. And the, the, the questions were just like, you know, how confident are you to build metrics? How confident are you with this? You know, what's your, and one of the questions on there was, 
um, how, how do you define the economic buyer? And um, they shared the, the data with us and there wasn't two answers on there the same. And I found an answer, you know, and this is obviously going to play towards, you know, the point I'm trying to make, but I found an answer where someone in the US had said the economic buyer is something along the lines of the person who signs the contract or like someone, uh, someone in the UK had said the economic buyer is the person who owns the budget. Someone in Europe had said, you know, it's the, it's the person, um, I can't remember, but it was, it was something very different, right? And, and then uh, in, in someone in APAC said, actually, we don't really find the economic buyers at all in our deals. And I thought to myself, to your point, how, how on earth would they, therefore, if you were trying to do what you were doing there, where you're trying to say to your marketing team, this is what this, you know, this is who this person is. And it just, it, so I think sometimes it's, it's it, we talk about medic being that common language, um, yeah. but like languages have dialects. And I think that like, you've got to make sure not just everyone's speaking the same language, but they're speaking the same dialect. Um, another example of this, a customer, this is a fun one, a customer of ours, really good at marketing. Um, they, they reviewed their Q4 last year and they identified that 85% of their customers are champions, the 85% of the deals they'd won, the champion was a persona that not only were they doing zero marketing to, but right. they'd been proactively 100%. discouraging their sales force for engaging with this person. It was the person that we, was the... We, we, we did the same thing, Andy. We, um, yeah. and, and, and I want to I be, be really careful here. It's not a bad thing to say mm. that, oh, this happened, right? So, so we did the same thing. We stopped. And after my first 12 months, I, we sat down as a team and we said, hey, wait on, here's our current buyer personas. Let's actually go back. And we did this as a team. And let's look at, the, oh, wow. We weren't targeting most of these people. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I think invariably what what that tells you is to your point, the the message has to be, you know, consistent. And we have to mm -hmm. think about new ways and different ways to get to different people in the organization because I think invariably who is the economic buyer? Um, I was reading a great piece by Joe Sexton the other day, who's, you know, obviously had a ton of success, App Dynamics and a whole bunch of other places. And um and he was literally saying in this article, how do you find an economic buyer today? when it's just so different at every company you go to because it's sometimes it's it's different because of the vertical sometimes it's different yeah. because of the size like when we look at our economic buyer at a you know fortune 100 bank versus mm -hmm. a social media or tech company very different drivers right yeah. uh, one one is going to be more on the engineering side because tech and social companies are very you know um, very driven from an engineering perspective. Mm -hmm. And so the engineering all drives a lot of the strategy and, and accountability and responsibility. But you go mm -hmm. over to a bank and, and it's very different, right? And yeah. so being able to say, oh, our economic buyer looks like this, it's, it's getting really hard. Um, yeah. So I think that's something that all I think we can say is let's continue to be cognizant of that and be constantly yeah. iterating and looking back every quarter at our cohort of deals and saying, what, hey, what did our economic buyer look like? What did our champion look like? What did our, our coach look like? Now, if, and if you're not using something like Medic, if you're not, you know, implementing, so, you know, we've implement, implemented Medic into the Salesforce instance itself, and, you know, we can report out on this now, and we sit there, right? So my partner in crime, our, our CMO, right, Prashant, we sit there now, and we look at it, and, and we tune as we go, right? And, you know, you want to be careful not to over-index per se, mm -hmm. but you want to start looking for trends, right? One, one change here doesn't make for a trend or a pattern, right? But yeah. over the last 12 months, we did see a trend and a pattern to engineering and product outside of the traditional security organization, right? That mm -hmm. became more than a one-off. That became a very strong trend. And so now we we're able to, to kind of work together and shift the messaging to, to address that audience as well. Yeah, and, and the thing with the, the thing of the economic buyer, I think, is that I think we, we, we know it how important they are and, and therefore we, we cascade that importance to the people working on the deals, which is good, that, that, that people are conscious and looking for that person. But you made the great point, you know, from one, from one uh, industry to another, the economic buyer changes a lot. I would even say to you, I'm sure you've seen this as well, you could be selling to one social network to another and the economic buyer could be an entirely uh, different. 100%, network, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah it's just, it's just more things... drastic sometimes when you go to another mm. industry. But, you know, I also believe, like I think you do, is look, the champion's still the most important role, right? Yeah. And that changes even sometimes more drastically as well, right? And so, yeah. look, this is what I, I think some people think sales is a binary, like what I love about sales and what we do 
and go to market is this is the fun part to me. This is where it you, it is like a game. It, it's a strategic game. It's like sitting down and and playing chess. And it, it's it's funny, you know, coming from Australia to to the US, you know, I, I kind of always kind of dissed a little bit on American football, right? You know, oh, come on, that's not a real <laughs> sport. You know, I'm like, gosh, how many stops and everything. What I've learned to love about American football, Andy, is the mm-hmm. strategy piece. Oh, I love that, right? yeah. And the fun I can imagine I, a coach making, or even basketball, right? You, you mm-hmm. think about the the nuances of when a timeout is called or a play is shifted, right? It's a little different to a free-flowing, you know, soccer or, or rugby, rugby league type of game, right? Not to say there isn't strategy. There's absolutely strategy. But the part I love about sales is it isn't just, oh, let's just wake up and whatever happens. We're in control of that. And it's actually fun mm-hmm. when you get the right people in a room and and you leverage, you know, frameworks like Medic and, and other elements as well. And you strategize, you sit down with marketing and, you know, we, we're going through 2023 planning right now. And it's so much fun to sit down and say, what do we want that to look like next year, right? Um, mm-hmm. To me, that's the fun part. Because if, look, if you just, if look, for some reps, get up, sell something, uh, that, maybe that's okay. Um, I find the best reps, the best leaders, the best CMOs, the best CROs are going to be ones that are really in this to build something great and and treat it strategically, not just tactically. And being there for the journey, getting the ingredients right, the foundations right. You're going to have great quarters. You're going to have bad quarters, but and you know it's going to look like this. But you will get up to the right. You know if you yeah. do those things together and right. use the data talk to each other, provide the feedback loop, invariably we will get there. It might be tough along the way and you'll lose some deals and there might be some tension between the orgs. That's all natural stuff, right? But if we, but if everyone is staying positive and aligned on where we want to get to and how we're going to get there and accepting that how we're going to get there is going to change along the way, I, I think, you know, you're, you're, you've got a higher probability of success than for those that don't. Yeah, and I, I like how you're talking about this because that that's one of the things that I'm really, really hot on at the moment because I see I see the upside to this point about making the downside as well, which is that I think it's so so important for teams, it's for leaders, for for individual contributors, everybody to know that sales is like you said, it's not some linear binary process. Binary process. It's it's uh, you know you can I always say it like this. It's like you can have the best product with the customer that needs it more than anybody else in the world and the best salesperson, that is not a foregone conclusion. You'll win that deal. There will be problems. There will be challenges. And in fact, if we're really being, if we're really trying to be the most professional versions of our industry, we shouldn't be measuring success as being binary as in, did we win the deal or did we lose the deal? Losing is obviously failure. Okay. And and, and we talked before about how that's not necessarily always a bad thing, but if we're winning, it's like, it's not just, did we win? It's like, how quickly did we win for how much money did we win for and how often do we win? But I think what it, what, what it comes back to though, the thing that I'm, the thing that I really want to make the point of is if, if we, if we have salespeople that think that, um, you know, that if, if there's a challenge with a deal, it's a reflection of their performance, then we, we're going to get ourselves into this really difficult, sticky spot where the, some of the most best sales teams that exist, I'm sure you have this culture in your team, are the ones where it's like, they are the very first to put their hands in there and say, hey, look, got a great deal here. This prospect really needs Arco's labs. Um, here's the reasons why. Here's what I know so far. But this person I'm working with isn't a champion or I haven't found the economic buyer yet. You know, I'm six months into this deal and I'm still not sure. It is a million times better than being six months in the deal, not being sure, but pretending it's somebody else. And I think we need to really kind of like normalize in sales, this culture of like being able to be confidently vulnerable. I I mean, there are the exact words that were going to come out of my mouth, right? I think we have to do more than normalize vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we have to incentivize and reward it. Um, Yeah. And and we've tried to do that, you know. When 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 you presented to our team, you know, we we took what you said to heart. And so, for example, we will write in our Slack channels kudos when someone makes yeah. a, a functional step uh, along close plan or, or medic. We will, I will say to a rep, I will pause a conversation, a review, and say, "Hey, Mark, you know, um, Adam, that's awesome, man. I'm thank you." for acknowledging that we're not where we thought we need to be. And here's yeah, the gap. Yeah. 
Because yeah. medic is not about being perfect. It's, it's identifying the gaps to fill them. And the reps invariably that figure that out first are the ones that are going to be the most successful, right? Yeah. I, I look, I'll, I'll be honest. One of my challenges is not being able to understand why some reps don't like to leverage executives, for example. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I get it. There's got to be balance. And there's probably people listening to this that are like, yeah, but Richard, you've been in our deals and you're too controlling and this and that. <laughs> We've got to find a balance, right? Like you, you've got to empower reps. But, you know, go, let's go all the way back to the, the big mega deal that I closed. There's a rep in Sydney that got me to America. Yeah. I, I was the quarterback, Andy, but I had, mm. I mean, we had the CEO fly down to Sydney. We had VPs, SVPs. At the time, we had the SVP of Asia Pacific. I, I rallied. I remember fighting for resources. I remember fighting to get executives into my deal. My job at the time was to connect the pain to the solution and the right people that could help articulate that. And I think that kind of goes hand in hand with that vulnerability, right? I think we've grown up in a world where, in a sales world where, Success is, you know, alpha male, alpha female, where I'm perfect. I've got this. Nothing's going to go wrong. I don't need your yeah. help. Um, yeah. and, and again, like everything else, times change fast. And Indeed. the reps that leverage and ask for help. And it's funny. What I love is, you know, and they were on the team, uh, David and Peter down in Australia, um, ad admitted after doing the course with you. Yeah, look, we, we thought we kind of knew medic, but but we realized that we didn't to the level that we want to, which already mm -hmm. right there, right? That's right there. That's growth mindset, right? Yeah. Brilliant. They came back month after month, excited. I'm not kidding you. Excited that as they were doing deal plans, realizing, oh man, we, we don't have half of this done. Actually, you yeah. know what? Let, let's cancel this review. We're going to come back and we got a bunch. Great. Okay. Go for it. They're yeah. nearly now running these things by themselves. Love right. It. And, and that's the behavior and the, and the kind of activity that we should be, as, as I'm saying this to you, I, I even need to be highlighting more, right. Is that's, that's going to get you there. That's going to get us there. Right. Not, not I've got this. And then invariably, whether we win or lose that deal, we didn't have the right people as part of in the boat learning and, and helping. Cause to your point, maybe we won it, but could have we won it three months earlier? Could have it been 30% bigger? Could, you know, like there's all these different things that, you know, it's not just the winning or the losing, right? It's it's the submetrics that, again, to your point, if we want to truly hold ourselves in our own kind of growth mindset, how, what, how could we do it, do it better, mm -hmm. right? It's could we have closed it faster? You know, and I think the other thing is in this new subscription economy, I don't think winning and losing is the definition of success anymore, the first deal, you know, especially in startups and scale-ups. I kind of, you know, people talk about product market fit and a lot of people have always said, well, you know, when you get your first 10 customers, you, you know, you've got product market fit. I, I would counter argue, no, I used to think when you get your first 10 customers that renew, you have product market fit. Now what I'd say is when you close your first 10 deals that renew and expand, you've got product market fit. Oh yeah. Okay. And, I, and I think we've got to start thinking through that lens of success in, in our new world is selling renewing and expanding because that's when you're truly demonstrating real value because the selling part is there's an element of trust and an assumption, right? Um, our, ours and maybe other companies are a little bit different because we, we more times than not do POVs. So we do actually get to demonstrate the, the actual uh, kind mm -hmm. of efficacy up front, right? But for a lot of folks where that doesn't happen, there is an element of belief on the part of the prospect. So it's only actually at renewal do you really know that your solution is providing value to that pain that was implicated 12 months earlier. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah, spot on. And th there's one last thing I want to talk to you about, which is something I know you're really, really good at and something I know that you and I are very much in sync on. When, and you've talked a bit about it from this executive support. You know, you, you're helping your guys, girls in the field um with with their deals and, and one thing we've talked about before is how you can and you do sometimes use um medpick to talk to your customers about you know yeah. not you know sometimes specifically telling them about you know how 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 you folks work i'd love to dig into that a little bit yeah absolutely um i think it was it was kind of an evolution 
of talking to some customers and uh, there was a really good example, Andy, where after we did the medic training with you and the kind of certification and stuff, right, um, I, I posted a picture on LinkedIn of it and um, I don't think I had the, the lovely mug yet, but, uh, you know, I had the book <laughs> and, and, and some other things and one of my champions, Nick, made a comment on there saying, oh, was I your champion? And <laughs> I, I spoke to him after the, after the fact. And, and I said, absolutely, you, you, you were. And we kind of talked through what that meant. And what we realized was without using the exact words, through the process, we, we, we articulated what medic looks like. We articulated without saying, Nick, you're our champion. We, we, we spoke about it. And you know, we took his feedback. You know, there was a time in the deal where I think candidly we we ignored the what we knew was the decision kind of process and mm -hmm. invariably, you know, tried to get the deal in faster, which by itself is not a bad thing, right? How do you accelerate pipeline and how do you accelerate deals? But not but but at the same time, you know, I think you have to be respectful of the culture of an organization that you're selling to. And because I think one of the worst things we can do is build a champion, again, whether you use the word or not with that person, um, and then potentially break that um, or put it at risk at least, right? Um, and so I think one of the things we've started doing is, is being more transparent about the process we go through, but the old what's in it for you. He, here's what we have seen. When we follow this, when we are able to talk to an economic buyer early. Oh, what's an ec economic buyer? Well, let, let's talk about that, right? Yeah. We ask people, yeah. I, I want to explain what we view as a champion. Andy, are you my champion? Do you want to be my champion? It's kind of a little nerve wracking, kind yeah. of like, I feel like I'm back in 10th grade asking, you know, a, a, a girl <laughs> to the, the formal, right? Yeah. But the same thing, if you don't ask and you don't know, right? And yeah. I think, you know, happy years and, and we all want to be optimistic and we think and we assume, right? What we do now is now, and again, and, and you, you say this so great in, in your training, you, you, you've got to use common sense. It's not just you walk in after two meetings. Oh, hey, Andy, you, will you be my champion? They, oh, what, what are you even talking about, man? We've had two meetings, right? You, you've got to lay it out at a, the right point in time. And what we've been saying is what we've noticed is that when we kind of follow this framework, the, the, the buying process is simplified. Yeah. It's accelerated. And if we go back to Andy, can I just reconfirm that the pain that we've implicated together two weeks ago, I mean, is that still, yep, yep, okay, yep. And so, okay, so every every month that goes by, you're impacting this security posture is being impacted and it's costing you X and bad user. Yeah, 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 no, Rich, absolutely. It's horrible. Okay, so what would it mean to you that originally you said you don't think you could go live probably until next Feb? But if we follow this and I truly tell you that I think we can get you there by November, would that, would that mean anything to you? And, and maybe by the yeah. way, Andy, sometimes the answer is no, right? Yeah. Invariably, I find the answer is yes, right? And so what, what I think positioning it as, I'm not, I'm not going to be shy and tell you I don't want to get this deal done sooner. It's in my benefit. But guess what? It's in yours. If yeah. you truly believe, and this is what I tell the reps, guys, if you truly believe that there is value and pain that's been implicated here, why would the customer not want to do this three months sooner? Help me understand yeah. that. I don't yeah. understand why. And often they go, well, we've got all these processes. And right, I know you do. Let me help you through that. You know, mm -hmm. Andy, I, I think I mean, a million people have said this. Your buyer is not a professional buyer. The, the security, the CISO that we sell to, or the head of engineering, or the, the head of fraud, the... The, the head of application, whoever your listeners are selling to, don't wake up every morning and, and say to their spouse or, or friend as they walk out the door, ah, oh, man, I'm so excited. I'm going to go buy four pieces of software today. Yeah. Yep. They're, they're solving other things, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, and so, again, I think what people miss about being a rep is being a true consultant, helping yeah. them go through that buying process. And so when we show them the mutual action plan, I don't shy away from it. I, I really early show them the mutual action plan. 
And then yeah. what I say is, let's fill it out. Now let's go back and how can we cut a week off every one of those steps? Brilliant. Is it Love possible? That. What, what would it look yeah. like? What would it look like if we took off every major milestone a week? Does it take this 12? Because like I was with a bank uh, about two weeks ago. And the conversation went a little something like this. Uh, we we really want to use Arcos. This the problem we have. It's it's really bad. Yep, 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 yep. And so this is October 2022. You know, I think I think late 23, early 24, I think we can get this this in. And I sat there, Andy, with just this look on my face that I yeah. think, you know, spoke a thousand words, which was and I paused, I just paused. Yeah. And I said, I, I don't understand. Well, you know, we've got processes to get through and la, la, la. And I said, I, I, I understand that. But let's work together on this mutual action plan. So we've closed a lot of banks, Mr. Prospect. Here are our certifications. We've got our FIPS. We've got this. We've got ISO. We've, got that. we've done this before. How can mm-hmm. we tackle this differently together? You know, mm-hmm. could we maybe start talking to this person over here in parallel? Or, oh, actually... I don't see why not. We yeah. we took what was going to be a 15 month process. Now, unfortunately, it probably still looks like a seven to eight month process. <laughs> but I mean, we nearly halved. I mean, I guess that's yeah. that's pretty effectively yeah. halving yeah. by sitting down yeah. and having an open conversation about how we've done it before and what it would look like if they let us help them. Yeah. Do you think it's so funny to me how we? It's 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 the, the thing that makes me laugh is that we forget or we assume it's almost like we act as if customers enjoy the buying process, right? We act as if they're they're having a good time uh, because what you're saying there is that you can take a proposition to the customer, say, "Hey, look, you know, you kind of you wouldn't say this, but you're frankly saying, hey, you don't you don't really enjoy this. What if I could get you what you want quicker, less hassle?" That's kind of like what you want to say. And what makes me, what, what really makes me laugh about this is I, I was on a, a conversation with a sales team recently and I was saying, I was kind of, I had a bit, had a bit, a bit, a bee in my bonnet about the fact that this year we've bought lots and lots of technology, right? You know, lots of SaaS product. And bet, we counted yeah. that we spoke over 30 AEs and I've only been sent one agenda. So some of those AEs I've met more than once. So let's say it's, it's, it's 45 meetings and I've been sent one agenda. And I was, I was moaning about this, right? I was saying like this, when I got the agenda from that one person, I was very happy because it made me think that they, the person valued my time. They'd put some thought into it. It was all good. It was all good. And yeah. someone um, piped up and said, I don't send agendas. And I was like, why not? And they said that they think that if they give, if they send an agenda, it's a, it's a gives the customer, the prospective customer an opportunity to reply and say, actually, I, can we not have this meeting? Can we cancel this I meeting? Whatever. And so I don't, I don't entirely disagree with the concept there that, you know, but the point is what that person's saying is customers don't like being sold to. They want to postpone yeah. those meetings, want to cancel those meetings. And so we know this, we know this is evidence of salespeople over here, but then over here where you're saying is a, a great strategy, I love it, is, is saying that, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, let me, let me work with me so I can make this a more efficient more professional yeah. process for you and we can get to where we want to get to sooner. And I just think like every and, point. Should be, and you've got to earn that right. So what I'd probably True. counter to the person that says the agenda, mm-hmm. you haven't implicated the pain. You, you yeah. haven't built the relationship with the champion. Cause if you have a champion yeah. and you've implicated the pain, mm-hmm. I, I would, and, and again, there's always nuances, right? There, there's always the person that just doesn't like the agenda or anything. But I, I think if you've done those things, they, and, and maybe it's also the words that we use on the agenda, right? If it's reviewing commercial proposal, you know, closed it, like let's also apply some common sense. But I, again, I think, I think it depends on what you've done before that, right? So, so many times say, oh, a rep will say, oh, no, that doesn't work. Okay, but, but in what order did you do it? What was the context mm-hmm. that it didn't work? If we did these things earlier... You know, again, let's not go too early. First meeting, you know, we, we were just reviewing our standard sales deck mm-hmm. the other day and uh, everyone had to pitch. Uh, everyone had to, uh, we did role playing uh, of medic in, in, a, in, a, in a prospect engagement. It was, right. it was a lot of fun. Um, cool. And little, kind of similar to what you just said, what I loved were the reps that did a couple of things. First of all, recap. 
first slide recap Brilliant. of where, yep. what we've spoken about, what I heard, and, and what we're here today to talk about. And then the last slide, the bookend, right? Yeah. Where are we going? Next steps, what that looks like, what's in it for you, right? I, I think I think where it doesn't work is when, again, reps write things that help them or, or is perceived to help their timeline, not the customer's. Right. Yeah. And and I think that's where we've, we've already, unfortunately, got a little bit of a bad rep in the market, right? Our salespeople. Um, but I think if we as an industry start to leverage things like Medic and think, truly think about how we don't waste the buyer's time and be real, I think you've got to be direct. You've got to be able to believe enough and also mm-hmm. be direct. Yeah, back to belief, right? And and just be super direct, you know, hey, hey, look, let's jump on this call. I want to help you get this done in Q4. I, I, hey, I can probably help you faster. You know, like when people ask for a discount, mm-hmm. everyone wants a discount, right? You tie it to this process and you say, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to be really upfront with you. If I spend six months less on this sale, I can probably share some of that margin with you. It's going to be a lot easier for me to go back to my CFO, well, that, say, hang on. That, that's gold. That is gold. I've never, I've never heard that before. So, like, I that, that like record scratch. That's brilliant. <laughs> that is brilliant. So you're saying that um, to ask for a discount, and you're saying the give and get is well. Look, you know, this the the most expensive, the most expensive cost we have right now in our business is is you <laughs> and this. And Absolutely. you're saying let's, yeah, wow. And, and sorry, it's continue. Just blew my mind. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and, and look, again, I think I think we've got to be transparent and direct, but you've got to you have to be authentic, right? And so I I was on a call two days ago where I was very direct. I, I knew that they had a budget they wanted to get under for two reasons. It's what they had left, and they were able to circumvent some longer processes in procurement. Okay, great. And we looked at it and it, it wasn't in the realm of ridiculous, you know, pricing. Um, and it's it's a fairly quick deal. And I just, I said to the, and we got in front of the economic buyer and I was very direct. It was a small call again, you know, not 20 people on the call. There were four of us on the call. And I said, you know, again, I'll, I'll use Andy. Andy, I understand what you're trying to achieve. Um, first of all, I went back before we even get to that, you know, implicated the pain, confirmed a few things. Okay, great. I felt like we're at a point where a deal could be done. And I said, I understand that you're looking to leverage 2023 budget. I also understand that you're trying to get this under this level and circumvent this and this. I'm going to be really direct with you. Um, It's the end of the year. For a growing SaaS company, finishing on a high is is really important to us. That's what's important to me. I understand Mm -hmm. what's important to you. How do we help each other here? It's going to be a lot easier for me to be able to go to my CFO and get what you just asked for if I'm able to say this is going to help us at the end of the year. And I don't understand. I've never understood what's wrong with saying that. What's wrong with being honest and transparent and saying, how do we both get a win here? I will give, but what do I get? And he turned around and he paused for a second, looked at me and said, I think we can make that happen. Wow. Don't ask, don't get, Andy. And But again, wow. do, do you ask without any context? Do you ask without any authentic transparency? Do you just be that, that fly-by-night sales rep that says, oh, I can get you 12% off end of quarter? But you haven't had the, the authentic conversation. By the way, at the right level, leveraging your CRO to economic buyer, the conversations do change. I, I want to be very fair to reps. Much easier. It's like I haven't said to our CEO, I've said to every CEO I've worked for, Yes, you get you get a better response rate than we do. Yes, you get a better engagement. You're the CEO. You're the founder. That kind of makes sense, right? Just like I get a better response or engagement rate than my VP and their AE. So leverage that. Elevate the conversation to someone that can make it happen and understands the economics. Because I always throw it back, Andy. I go to the VP and because invariably everyone has a number to hit. Our customers have numbers to hit, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And I said... I'm, I've got goals. You've got goals. Your goal right now is to solve this problem. We can work on the, the payments and the this and the that, but what's important for me right now? 
and and I've been upfront with folks as well to say like, especially in these six month examples that we used before, you know, maybe I don't go this far with some of them, but internally it's the opportunity cost that worries me, Andy. It's the extra six months I'm working to, our teams are working to close that. Now that's an extra six months that I'm not working over here. And yeah. so when I get back and say to the CFO very directly, hey, I'd like another five points. And the CFO's job is to understand why, why are we just giving away five points? I, I sit with a whiteboard in his office and I say, so let's work this out really quickly. If we can close this in Q4 versus Q2, that five points equals X. And so now I'm taking my metrics to my internal because there's internal selling all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Well, now Johnny can go work on the next three deals. In, in the 20 hours a week he's working to try to close this, how many phone calls can he make? How many prospecting calls can he make? How many new deals are coming into the business in that time? And invariably, we, we come to an arrangement and, and uh, everyone's happy. <laughs> Hopefully. Everyone's happy. Oh, wow. Look, this is, this is going to be one of those things where it's like when this episode comes out, those listening that are listening right now that have been all the way through, you will know exactly what I mean. Like, I think this is going to be like dangle the carrot. There's absolute gold at the end of this episode. I mean, the whole episode's been absolutely brilliant and I've loved our conversation. So thank you so much, Richard, for joining us and, and sharing that. But that, that, that last bit there, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be hitting rewind on that and listening to that bit again and again and again. So yeah, thank you so much, Richard, for joining us. I think when we, we first talked about this, I said, you said like, how long should we go for? And I said, look, anything yeah. around 45 minutes is great. And we've been going an hour and 20 minutes and it, it, it's, it's uh, flown by. It's I, um, flown I'll by. I'll be honest, when you said 45 minutes, because um, you know I've done some podcasts on the other side yeah. of the table, right? And I was thinking you were going to say 20 to 30 and then you said 45 <laughs> and, and I'll be honest, and I thought to myself, what are we going to talk about for 45 minutes? And then to your oh. point, I just looked down and this has been awesome. Every time I talk to you, you know, it was, we were so fortunate to be able to grab a couple of beers in London only a couple of months ago. Uh, I, I think what I love when you and I talk is back to what we we're talking about a moment ago is we get, we're excited by this. We're passionate about mm. this, right? Mm. It's, it's, we really enjoy what we do. And, and this is a domain that, that we're all just trying to get better at. And uh, it's great to always talk to, to folks that, uh, that, that have that growth mindset and that belief. So no, thank you. And thanks for everything you've done with our organization and, and great to see the success that, that you guys are having. And uh, it's, it's been a pleasure, mate. Thank you. Right. Well, one last thing I noticed, yeah. I, well, I don't even need to look to see this, but I did, I did check. You've got a number of roles at the moment. If I was an AE listening to you speak for the last hour, almost hour and a half, I'd be like, this is, this is a place I want to go and work. This is somebody I want to work for. So you've got open roles. Who are you looking for and where are you looking for them? Let's, let's, let's get some people in. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, and, and the AE that's still listening at an hour and 20 minutes, their attention span, that's <laughs> awesome. I want that person. Um, look, we have open AE roles in New York, in Seattle, LA, San Francisco, um, we have uh, pre-sales roles uh, as well. Um, look, we're constantly, here's the other way we look at things, uh, Andy, is we're always looking for great talent. We're looking for people that meet that ideal candidate profile. And so we've hired people when we've thought we've not needed someone in a particular area. And, and we've kind of worked with that person because one of the things we spoke about earlier at AppDirect was hiring, getting the right people on the bus and worrying about the seats later on. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you know, we're at a later stage, scale, uh, you know, part of the journey, part of the series now where we can't just hire another person in a particular city. But, but I would say I think there's always room for great people. And so people that, that have liked what they've heard, that are interested in our space and want to come build and be part of something great, work hard, be intense, but have a lot of fun along the way, I, I'd love to hear from them. So thanks for that opportunity. Yeah. No, great. Where can people find you? LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, uh, Dufty Down Under on Twitter uh, and on LinkedIn. So probably the easiest places to, to find me. We'll make sure we put those links in the show notes. So thank you once again, Richard. This has been an absolute honor and a pleasure. And I feel like my, my, my brain is like throbbing from all the, uh, the great insights and ideas you've given me. So uh, thank you very much, sir. And thanks to the listeners for tuning in. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thank you.